Falls. Dennis Lloyd Martin. What happened to Dennis? So of all the cases I've ever written about, this is the one that disturbs me the most, George. Disturbs uh, you. Okay. June 14th, 1969, six years old. Dennis went with his dad, his grandfather, his nine-year-old brother into uh, Great Smoky Mountain National Park, and they hiked into an, to an area called Spence Field. This sits on the Appalachian Trail right on the border of North Carolina and Tennessee. And the two boys were running around playing on this big field with their dad and grandpa sitting there watching. And up walks a family and says, hey, can our boys play together? And you're not going to read about this anywhere. And it won't make any sense to you now, as it made no sense to me. But the family reaches down to shake hands with Mr. Martin and they say, oh, yeah, our last name's the Martins, too. What would be those odds, George? Pretty high, I would think, but possible. So they said, yeah, could, it, could the kids run around and play together? And they said, sure. Both families are sitting down in the grass. Boys are running around. They start playing a game of hide-and-seek. Mr. Martin is one of the sharpest men you'll ever meet. And uh, he sees his son run behind a bush right on the edge of the field, right where the, the wilderness starts, and everyone's playing hide-and-seek, and, seek and his, he's watching. And everybody comes out after the end of the game, and his son doesn't come out. He walks over to the bush, his son isn't there, and he takes off on a dead run down the Appalachian Trail for two miles. He doesn't find him. He comes back and he tells his uh, dad to go down and get more rangers because they need help. And they go down. This happened at about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. By the time Rangers got there, it was about 5. And by 8.30, it was raining like cats and dogs. Now, as the boys were playing this game of hide-and-seek, 2,000 feet below them, in an area in Cates Cove called Rowan's, R-O-W-A-N-S, Creek, a family asks a ranger where they can go to see some bear. The ranger tells them to go up Rowan's Creek about a mile, mile and a half, and they should see some wildlife. This family, their last name is K-E-Y. It's the key family, and it's key for a reason. The family walked up the valley, and they report hearing an enormous, sickening scream louder than they could ever imagine. At hmm. about the same time, their son says to the dad, Look at Dad, there's a bear running in the bushes up there on the hill. The dad says, no, son, I don't think that's a bear. They thought it was a man hiding behind the trees in the bushes, hiding from them. Now, this is simultaneous or just after Dennis disappeared, maybe an hour after. Now, obviously, the Key family didn't know anything about that Dennis had disappeared the hour previously or two hours previously. But what they were seeing was odd. But they didn't think much about it other than it was really weird. Right. So they go home. And the next day on the front page of the Knoxville Times is a picture of Dennis Martin and this disappearance. And Mr. Key says, well, the time frame and the distance could make some sense. So he read in the paper that the FBI had an agent monitoring the case. So he calls the FBI and he says, hey, I'll meet you at the park. I'll show you exactly where I saw what I saw. And the agent tells him, no, myself and a National Park Service ranger will meet you outside the park at a different location, which makes no sense. Until you understand that the Park Service and the FBI had an agreement with Mr. Martin. In two months, the man never left the park. He wanted to know about everything that was happening with the every search for detail. Yeah. Every detail. And he had an agreement that he was going to get told that. Three days after the FBI and the Park Service meet with the Key family, a reporter for the Knoxville Times hears about it third hand from a law enforcement source and confronts the FBI, and they admit that they went to interview this person, and they admit to what they were said. So the press reporter tracks down the Key family and gets the interview, and then tells Mr. Martin, well, he goes livid. Why are you hiding this from me? And the FBI just says, because it's irrelevant. The time frames don't matter, and it's impossible. Well, standing next to Mr. Martin at the time 
was one of the trackers for the Park Service, a guy named Dwight McCarter, who ended up being the head tracker for the Park Service when he retired. In an interview that we got about this story, Dwight said he knew the FBI was lying when they said it. He said, I know, I know the area in the woods like the back of my hand. We could walk that in an hour and a half, and it could, we could do this. So he and Mr. Martin, the next day, walked the path from where his son disappeared to where the people made the sighting. And they prove it could be done. So as this is going on, and they're in the middle of that first week, in fly a couple Huey helicopters filled with Green Berets. Here they come again. Here they come again. Now this time, McCarter tells me that it was the oddest thing he'd ever seen. The FBI, or the Green Berets, didn't want anything to do with the Park Service. They didn't want any escorts, escorts through the park who knew the park and knew the area that wanted to be searched. The Green Berets set up their own telecommunications system and tell everyone to just stay away from them. They'll search on their own. They were there for a week. Nobody knows what they found, what they were looking for other than Dennis. This is another one of those things where we file Freedom of Information Act requests. Never got anything. Now, Mr. Martin was livid because he didn't feel anybody was telling him the truth. And, McCar and Dwight McCarter was the one guy he trusted because McCarter told him, this distance we could do it. They did do it. They proved the time frames worked. Obviously, the biggest clue in this disappearance is what the key family saw. Now, nobody, Mr. Martin won't talk to the press and won't talk to law enforcement. I have tracked him down, and he lives in the same house that he lived in at the time his boy disappeared. And myself and another researcher just went cold knocked on his door. He came to the door. I explained who I was. And he said, Dave, my wife and I made a promise that we wouldn't talk about this anymore. It's ruined my life. It's ruined our family's life. Well, I explained to him that I came here from California. I guaranteed to him I knew more about this story than anybody. And would he just give me 15 minutes of his time? He looked at his wife. He closed the door. He stepped outside on the porch. And we had a conversation. And I asked him, I said, what's the one or two things that I should know about this case that isn't in the press, that nobody wants to talk about it, but what you know. He says, well, there's a couple. He says, you know that family, what they saw on the hill? I said, yeah. He said, well, the newspaper and the park service won't tell anybody this, but when they saw that thing on the hill, it had something on its shoulder, and nobody will talk about it. Like, like it was carrying him? Carrying his son, that's what the implication was. Yeah. And then the other thing is, he says, Dave, do you know about the other disappearances in the park and the surrounding area? And I said, actually, I know about 12 of them, and Jeez. I named them. And he says, well, do you know about the FBI monitoring those cases? And I named the FBI agent. I said, yeah, he's been on all the cases. And he says, do you know what happened to that agent? I said, no. He says he committed suicide. Oh. Now, I never put that in the book until I validated it from another FBI agent in Tennessee, and it's true. What would have pushed him to that? The million-dollar question. Now, we went up and we interviewed Dwight McCarter. And uh, I asked Dwight, I said, so with everything you know about Dennis Martin, what do you think happened? He says, I think he got abducted. And I said, well, how come the Park Service won't talk about it? He says, that's the million-dollar question. Now, when we, I, hear, we hear that word abducted, David, it's got uh, several possibilities. What, what was he talking about? He thought, he thought something forcefully took Dennis Martin off that hill. But he's not sure what that something was. Well, now, there's the, there's the interesting part of the story. Before I get there, though, when I did a Freedom of Information Act for this report, it was huge. And I went through it six times. And in that report... There is nothing written by the National Park Service ranger that accompanied the FBI agent to interview the Key family. There is nothing in that file about the Key family sighting. Huh. Nothing. Now, what McCarter told me is that I said, well, how could the Key family, their son, misinterpret a man for a bear? That, that's a hard misinterpretation. It's a big misinterpretation. He told me that... Uh, there are a series of wild men, meaning people like you and me who live off the grid that wear animal pelts up there in the woods, and the Park Service can't control it. 
And he said at the time, about a year or two before Dennis disappeared, a Park Service ranger was attacked by one of these people and nearly killed because the person that attacked the ranger was armed. But at the time, the National Park Service enforcement rangers were not armed. So his feeling was that one of these wild people that lived up there took Dennis. But he goes, it's just conjecture, but I do still think he was abducted. So let's now, get in. Go ahead. Well, one more thing I want to say about this is sure. that when this book came out, this was the cornerstone case, and it was all backed with fact. Because I had the, the news articles, I had the reports, I had everything laid out to a key, and I had Dwight McCarter's testimony. So we held a press conference in Knoxville, and we got every major news organization, ABC, NBC, CBS, and Fox, to come. And they asked every question under the sun. And we had displays. We laid it out perfectly. It was just about the, den the Dennis disappearance. And do you know, all of them left except one news agency, and this one reporter said, Dave, i got to tell you, this will never make the air. I go, why is that? He goes, it just won't ever make it. The park, park means too much to this local community. And what it means is it means $800 million a year to the local area around the city of Knoxville Jeez. and the surrounding region. And do you know, George, nothing about this ever made the press? It's Knoxville. the greatest kept secret out there, I bet. It is. 